Hey, Jonas. Hi. Thanks for coming um, to the yard. Um, really so excited much. to um, meet you. Um, we all love your play. Can Thank you, you tell us a bit about how, um, why, and how you started to write it? Um, I think it started off with I became curious in this, like the political sort of consequences of the use of the word we. You know how you say like political figures tend to say we must do this or yes we can or and I became interested in like what who is a part of that we and what happens when you when that we is kind of fragmentized and I think that throughout my writing I've, been, I've always been curious to I've been trying to investigate like political consequences of the use of words I think or like the maybe like the link between words and manipulation and manipulation, the link between words and power. So this play is, I guess it's, it's about um, one person who is being split into three persons and then start fighting about who they are in a way. Um, and I was, I was thinking quite a lot about the feeling that I still have of being kind of split into this kind of middle-aged me, and then I have, you know, the voice of my older self, who's like 70 and just want to chill and have pets, and the younger self, maybe 15 to 18 years old, who was much more revolutionary and much better at giving simple answers to, um, uh, well, everything, I guess. Um, so those are kind of sort of like the starting points of writing this play. Um, often you say that good writing is um, specific in detail. In order to move you, it has to be specific. And, and I was interested in trying, I'm not sure if it works, but trying to zoom out. Is it possible to write super general and still move people? Often I start off with quite theoretical ideas and then um, this person who is split into three versions of herself uh, gets the chance to relive her life and then uh, things started happening like beyond my control and so but those were sort of a few starting points that I remember thinking about. And um, it's really interesting this idea of language in the political, in a political context because exactly the same has happened here oh, really? yeah. um, in terms of like the extent to which we are presented with something and language becomes just part of that presentation, yeah. part of the image, yeah. rather than um, anything with substance or meaning. Mm. Mm. Um, and in this country we're currently having that battle with yeah. um, politicians that say, I mean what I say. Yeah. And then yeah. politicians who um, are um, just saying something, yeah. and it's often quite hard to differentiate between the two. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, like, in the process of writing, in exploring the role of language yeah. in the in the political sphere, because yeah. the play does have politics sort of invading it. Yeah. What? How you kind of? Um, approached language that was um, political yeah. because there are very politicized moments yeah. in the show yeah. Yeah. Um, and because yeah. if we're if you're if you're if you're kind of dissecting this one word we and yeah. this, how that how that then impacted on how you approach the rest of the politics yeah I think it's interesting what you said your choice of words that the political invaded the play because I think that was also my you know, often when I write, like I've written a lot of crappy things, but the things that I've written where I feel that you know I'm touching on something that um, that becomes something you know that I can s uh, proudly present to someone else than myself. Like it's it's often when I feel like politics, the outside world is kind of invading my you know starting points that are often. Theoretical, and that's what happened when I wrote this play. That um, I wrote it in a period 
uh, which is sad but true, but like the, it was one of the many moments where bombs were, were falling over Gaza. And I just felt that I've seen those, these images so many times and I get like body, my body reacts to them a certain way, but it's almost like like a bad drug that my body stopped reacting to, you know, like all these images, I'd seen them so many times of dead children, of, you know, um, corpses on in, in hospitals, but still, um, I, I was scared to sense that it was almost like I became neutral to them, and I, as you said, politics invade this play, but politics also invade the, the main character, trying to make sense of her life, you know, trying to um, exist without politics and without constructing a world um, uh, distant from the outside world, so to speak. But then, then she is also being invaded by pictures and in photos and words that she is desperately trying to kind of fantasize her way out of, so to speak. She is, you know, there's this moment in the play where she is trying to translate um, words that we all know mean um, conflicts and political battle, but she tries to translate them into something nice and uh, uh, family-oriented, orientated uh, to her kids, uh, you know, like trying to, uh, yeah, try, trying to almost to put up walls around her Because if she sees what is going on, she would have to change either herself or the outside world. I think that's, uh, she's, she's me in the sense that she's trying not to change or trying to, um, yeah, trying to find an easier way than to realize your own power position. Mm. I think it also comes from the fact that I, I'm, a long time I've had this kind guilt that I was not better at taking part in real politics. I know that that sounds quite naive to separate like real politics from written politics, whatever that is, but I have quite a lot of friends who are engaged in the way that they are hiding refugees or better at demonstrating and, and you know, taking that kind of active part in politics. And I've always been a little bit, I guess, ashamed of my inability to act. Also ashamed of the fact that I can sort of like understand all sides. Mm. You know, that feeling of being like, well, she's got a point and he's got a point. Like, and that creates this sense of being, um, yeah, that can be, that can, you can end up in a situation of like complete in, inactivity. Mm. And I think that's what the main character also feels. Mm. One of the things that we, um, were really interested in was this letter that you wrote yeah. to um, you, the Swedish politician and um, the female uh, female Swedish politician. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to hear you say that you feel guilty about inaction when that letter has been shared so much um, in Sweden and beyond online. Yeah. Um, and that seems to me a very kind of um, uh, active yeah. thing that you did and I was just wondering like why you think it's been shared and what prompted you to write it and um, the extent to which it resonates now yeah um, I guess yeah it's active in a, in one sense but it's still um, writing it's still words you know like I'm not I've always found it easier to write about life than to actually live it, you know. So I think that's where the guilt comes comes in, in a way. Um, I was really happy to see that that letter had, you know, got the attention that it did. But that was not my thinking when I wrote it. I actually, the basic idea was that I was just um, so angry with a number of people's inability to see that we live in a contemporary time where 
the national identity, the idea of the national identity is so historic and needs to be updated and fragmentized. And I think that the reason why the ledger, which deals with, you know, to put it bluntly, it deals with um, racial profiling. And it tries to, I just try to show that a lot of people who are not considered to be a part of the we or the us, you know, linking back to this play actually, um, uh, for a lot of people, um, uniforms and uh, like symbols of power or politicians even are not representing security or democracy, but rather memories of um, abuse and discrimination. And that is not to say that my experiences were anything in particular. Like the strange thing when I wrote this letter was that what I said was so um, minuscule compared to what other people have lived through. But I think that was also the power of it, of the letter, that so many people have uh, quiet, have, have chosen to be quiet because there's always someone who is worse off. <laughs> you know, but, well, the cops took me and they handcuffed me and I had to sit in the police car for 20 minutes, but I know a friend of a friend of a friend who was dragged down the street, blah, blah, blah. you know, there were always experiences who were, who, that were worse. So I think the reason why it was so shared, shared and so got the reactions in, that it got, I think it was linked to the fact that there were so many people who could just relate to this feeling of, you know, yeah, you're right. When I see uniforms, I don't feel secure. I feel threatened. And why is that? Why have the law never been on my side? Why has the, the, the idea of us never included me? Um, and I think what was interesting was also that this letter was translated to land, countries that I've never visited or uh, so it's not about ethnic identities or religious identities or it could be all of those things but it's just um, you know we have a democratic problem when a lot of people don't see themselves as part of the we and I think that was what the letter was trying to say um, um, but, uh, yeah. and what are you working on um, now now Next. yeah actually I'm a little bit my half my brain is in Stockholm at the moment because I have a um, new show opening next week which is about uh, numbers and economic demons um, it's called uh, you know the sign for equal to I don't know what yeah. you say in English we also have like you know the, the almost equal to sign the kind of crooked equal to yeah that's yeah. the sign of the place called almost equal to but like with the wavy kind of thing. Uh, so we just had our first preview today with audience. So I just got a text from the director giving me like a... How'd it go? She said that there were good reactions from the crowd. They had packed the house with, uh, as she described it, as um, they packed the house with uh, theater haters. Uh, and I was just like, where did you find them? She was like, it wasn't too tricky. <laughs> it was very easy to find them. <laughs> like young people who were not yeah, yeah, yeah. typically theater goers. And they were apparently they had been like super into it and also answered back quite a lot. Ooh, and I think answered back Jack. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. They would be like, no, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Watch out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and do you write novels as well? Yeah, I, I'm writing a novel now, which will be published next year. And what is it, did, like what makes you write... Um, a novel and what makes you write a play? How do you decide that this is a novel and how do you decide that this is a play? The thing is, like, there's this official answer that I would like to tell you. The, you know, that the, I have this mantra for myself that I only, you know, that, that it's all about stories and the form doesn't matter. But I think it's not true. I don't believe myself when I say that because there's, I think, the ideas that become plays are often linked to the fact that like those stories need bodies. They need phys bodies who are present in that physical space. Um, because that's what I enjoy. When I go to see the theater, I, I don't want to go and see something that I can see at home, because I like to be at home. <laughs> I like my couch, I can just sit at home and watch that. And I need to understand why my very 
tall, you know, difficult to move body would transport itself to London or to any theater, you know, to be present. Um, so I think that's kind of where, normally when I write, I realize that, okay, we need some bodies to, to make this text come alive.